This is the Trauma Resonance Resilience Podcast. And this is for you if you are interested in compassion, connection, and relationships, and how we can all work together, creating services that do not add to harm, but rather seek to support recovery from it. I'm your host, Lisa Cherry, and this is your time to sit back and listen in on conversations that make a difference. Welcome to the podcast today. Well, it's another exciting episode, as all the episodes of my podcast are, of course, because today I have a leading education consultant and independent researcher with over 10 years in education research and community engagement. She's previously worked as a youth worker and university lecturer and is currently the director of MA Education Consultancy. Her work focuses primarily on educating practitioners in various fields on anti-oppressive practice, anti-racist practice, as well as offering equity coaching and support as those um, organizations embark on the challenge of creating anti-oppressive workspaces and practices. We're also going to be looking at a little bit around historic trauma, the impact of that on individuals and how they experience that in the workplace. Welcome, Dr. Muna Abdi. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for having me on. (laughs) Hello, hello. Very, very lovely to have you here. Now, we met at a conference recently and you kindly were in a workshop that I was doing. And I didn't get to reciprocate and come to your workshop. So I thought, I'm going to go one up on that and I'm going to get you on the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start really, what, what's your journey? I mean, how did you get to the point you are now? What's the trajectory that has brought you to do the work that you're doing? So I've always been somebody who has been a bit of an activist seeing uh, any injustices that are around me, wanting to try and do something good to evoke change and just to make people's lives a little bit better. I started off in the youth work um, and I was doing some work around community engagement around that. But for me, education just kept being centered in a lot of the work that I was doing. So the pe- the young people that I was working with, the parents and the community members that I was engaging with, the conversation always came back to, what was happening at school, what was being taught, what were people learning, what were they not learning, or what about their experiences was visible or invisible within the school space. So for me, there was just an interest and a fascination with education as a system. And so I went and did my undergraduate degree, my master's and my PhD, all in education research. And it just sparked a real fascination about looking at how experiences are captured within the school the classroom space but those experiences are not always understood or recognized and by that I mean particularly how people's lived experiences are always brought into the classroom but the classroom is still presented as a fairly neutral learning space and it has never been that for me. Oh my goodness, we are going to have a good session because that really kicks in nicely with my feelings around equity and around uh, it's not a level playing field. So can we stop pretending that it is? Can we stop thinking that somehow everyone's coming in on a blank page and that that's what we work with? So, I mean, that's quite an in-depth exploration to do that right the way through to PhD level. I mean, what? Where did that take you when you were starting to think about the impact of what we bring into the classrooms? I guess we might journey into, is that diversity within a classroom setting reflected amongst teaching mm. staff? And, I, and my hunch is, no. No, absolutely. And for me, there's always been two sides of the, the work that I've done. It's always been at an individual level looking at the individuals are actually in the classroom, the young people, the teachers, and thinking about how those identities are constructed and negotiated within that space, but also looking at it at a structural and a systemic level of how is the education system actually designed? Who is it designed for? And what work do we need to do to dismantle some of those structures so that those stories that are silenced, those experiences that are invisible in the classroom can actually be made visible? And, and sometimes mm-hmm. it is structures that are allowing certain experiences to be maintained and certain experiences to be silenced. 
and then in other instances and sometimes simultaneously alongside it it's those everyday individual interactions that can make the biggest difference yeah so let, let's let's break that down then so what what kind of experiences are not reflected in the classroom so my work centers on anti-racist practice and race is the obvious one to identify in any aspect of the classroom interaction. So if you look at the curriculum, there isn't the diversity in the curriculum that there needs to be. It's very Eurocentric. There are the lived experiences of minoritized groups that exist within the UK are not captured within the national curriculum. And even within looking at the British history, for example, things like empire, the impact of colonialism are not taught within schools. And that has a ripple effect because a lot of the times what we see within society are the learning that has taken place within the school space manifested into practice. And so we have to hold schools and the education system more generally to account for what knowledge that we are producing as a society. And it really does start there. So from the national curriculum, if you look at the diversity of teaching staff, we don't have that much diversity at all. And by diversity, I'm talking specifically about ethnic diversity because it can be interpreted in lots of different ways. And the diversity discourse is a whole other conversation we could have. But for me, it's predominantly those two areas. It's looking at the national curriculum, what we're actually teaching and looking at who is doing the teaching and looking at representation because that's hugely important as well. Do you think there's a denial? I mean, if we think about what's included in curriculum, what people are taught, what people understand about colonisation, about slavery, about those aspects. In your experience in doing your PhD, because that means that you've read a lot on the subject, (laughs) um, is that down to a deliberate act of withholding power? Is it down to a misunderstanding? Is it down to what brings that about because I mean that I remember that really being a very fascinating thing for me Mm. I mean many years ago just thinking about that why don't we talk about this and why don't we talk about that and why don't we talk about I mean Akala's book I really enjoyed his book I mean he god he's such an intelligent writer isn't he He's brilliant he's brilliant absolutely I mean that's a bit of a hardcore book I have to say Mm. but really breaks down post-colonialism and 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 the intersection of that around Brexit and around where we are now. I think yeah. if anyone hasn't read that, I think that that should be on the curriculum. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's, it can be really simple to say it is deliberate and it's intentional, but I think it's more complicated than that. I think systemically, we, we do have an education system at the moment that is designed to be Eurocentric. It is by design. And it is extremely narrow and there are certain narratives that are centered and that are prioritized. And there are certain narratives that are deliberately erased and aren't included in the national curriculum. So I think on a structural level, it is deliberate and it is intentional. I think on an individual level, there is a certain level of willful ignorance. And by that, I mean, there is an unwillingness from some educators to not do the work of finding out what is missing in the subject area that they're teaching and trying to make those narratives more inclusive and more representative of what the actual history of Britain is, whether that's it looking at the English curriculum, geography, history. But I also think we put a lot of pressure on teachers by assuming they have access to knowledge when these are the same teachers who have gone through the education system and a teacher education program that has done nothing but maintain those broader ideologies. Mm. So we're expecting them to have done additional learning to what was made available to them. I think we're in a very fortunate place at the moment where we have so much literature that's available to us from Akala, from David Olasago, for example, that have written about empire that have written about colonialism that have written about the impact of that on how britain looks today and the impact it's having on individuals so there isn't really an excuse for educators to not read those books and then have a look at their curriculum and think what can i do to change this 
Yeah, and I guess also you could throw into there in less academic writing uh, from Benjamin Zephaniah, from Rennie Edo Lodge. Yeah. I'm really interested in this, in what you're talking about, purely because I suppose, you know, I'm very interested in my own blind spots, you know, and that's mm. part of my uh, desire is always uh, with anything that hasn't been experiential and mm. that means I need to work much harder when you said that to do the work it is work because absolutely you know I'm very aware that predominantly the people who have come on this podcast are white women mm-hmm predominantly now there's a reason for that it's not because I'm not actively wanting to encourage and have all sorts of different voices on here but there is clearly something about what we attract to us something about blind spots something about needing to be very vulnerable about getting it wrong vulnerable about white privilege which we see that defensiveness when we have those conversations come up on twitter Because it's really difficult, isn't it, to sort of go into that place and go, actually, why am I only either A, attracting or giving voice to or finding or whatever it is, those one type of voices when that's not my intention? What is it within me that Mm. I'm not opening up to or working through? Mm. And that level of dialogue is that level of internal and external dialogue is very vulnerable and also confrontational uh, yeah. by default. Like Absolutely. The confrontation is with myself and I'm good yeah. with it. I see that as my role to be constantly questioning and thinking and assessing and uh, apologising and, <laughs> you know, getting it wrong. You know, But that's not the conversation that I see unfold in Mm. public spaces around white privilege and around racism. Absolutely. And I think a lot of the times we continue to do what we know because it's convenient and digging into our blind spots is uncomfortable. Mm. And we try and avoid the discomfort. And I think that's the biggest thing that we need to recognize is we're going to have to be uh, uncomfortable in order for change to happen. And that means we're going to have to start with ourselves. And it's one of the reasons why I I encourage people to start with unconscious bias or implicit bias training. But I really think those training programs are very reductive and simplistic and extremely problematic if they're not followed up with deeper, more meaningful work that can actually be translated into action. Because one of the things that we need to understand is we are unlearning things that we have been brought up conditioned to see as our normal so it's extremely traumatic for us to try and unpack all of that and think what have I been experiencing growing up that other people haven't been experiencing and how do I now name that as privilege yeah and I guess it's that a level sociology conversation Mm -hmm. where that starts off right you've got this uh, a group of young white youths and a group of, and they, I think, I can't remember, but I think there was like a film of then um, a group of young black males, young white males, both standing by a broken bike. And then it was secretly being filmed, people's re- reactions to what was going on to start to unpick some of those unconscious bias. But just stay stay with that for the moment. When, you t- when you're talking about how problematic it is, just talk us through for people who aren't aware of those kind of training conversations. Just talk us yeah. through what that looks like and then what the, what the challenges are and then where you might want to go with that conversation to make it more fruitful. Yeah. If you imagine our experiences are the tip of an iceberg, if you've got the imagery of an iceberg and on, on the tip of the iceberg, you've got what you can see, what you can feel, and what it sounds like okay those are the everyday lived experiences and the interactions that we can name and we can somehow experience as conscious experiences so if I talk about racism as somebody who's encountered racism I can tell you from my experience what racism feels like what it looks like and what it sounds like But underneath that iceberg, there are systems, there are stereotypes, there are ideologies, there are structures that enable 
environments that are oppressive to exist. And what unconscious bias training is, is supposed to do and sometimes successfully does, is bring some of those deeper rooted structures to our conscious and bring it to the surface so that when we're on top of the iceberg, we can start to make sense of some of the things that we see in front of us and start to make sense of why we may not have understood what people were seeing, what they were feeling, and what they were experiencing, because maybe those structures that upheld those environments were structures that we were complicit in also upholding so it just brings things to the surface and again when you bring things to the surface it's like opening a wound mm. and this is why I said it's pro- it's quite traumatic because if you take somebody to unconscious bias training or if you do an exercise with them that is about recognizing their privilege mm. and you bring those things to the surface and you open that wound if you don't follow that up with something that is going to help them heal and going to help them actually make sense of what created that wound to begin with, you're leaving that person in a very very vulnerable position. Yes, and that's making me think about the shame. Mm -hmm. That actually it's about getting past the shame. If there is some, I mean, there isn't always some, let's face it, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes people feel very comfortable with their position and don't want to explore all of that yeah. and, and and Robin D'Angelo's book on white fragility is excellent for this because mm. the book talks about all of the different ways in which people respond to once they recognize that they've been made aware of what white privilege is their responses so there is denial there's mm-hmm. guilt there's shame there's there's a full range of emotions that that manifest but it's when that when that is brought to somebody's conscious awareness, you'll see those in front of you. And then it's a case of how do you respond to that? And so in terms of thinking about opening up that wound and working with that in some way, Mm -hmm. what might be the next best step other than leaving people sat with the shame, the guilt, the denial? It's tricky because once you start that work, it's ensuring that that person, before they even embark on that work, is making a lifelong commitment to continue Mm. because it's not something that can be developed overnight. Doing anti-oppressive work of any kind requires you to constantly be in a state of wanting to learn. And sometimes that means constantly being in a state of discomfort and understanding that that discomfort is necessary in order to move forward and that there isn't going to be convenience, there isn't going to be stability, there isn't going to be a template or one standardized way of working because you're unpacking all of the things that you've learnt along the way. So you're doing a lot of unlearning and that is extremely uncomfortable. I always say to people, if you're doing anti-oppressive work, you have to have a support network You have to have people with you that you can feed back with, that will be part of your self-care, that will support you along the journey. It is very difficult when there is the dynamic of a white person, for example, who is doing anti-racist work and somebody who is a person of color doing anti-racist work because the burden that they carry is very different. Yes. There's lots of parallels here with trauma, which... You know, certainly around, I think about intergenerational historical trauma, which Mm. I hope we get into. But I mean, I just want to make it clear for people who are listening that I'm feeling uncomfortable. Mm. You know, I want I I want to say that because because the fears are going to be, and I'm being very explicit about this for the listener about being getting it wrong. Yeah, about all the stuff that I'm sure you hear all the time about getting it wrong, about not asking the right questions, about about being part of that system, being part of that structure, and not wanting to be. Um, yeah. I mean, again, you know, my my experiences are different to lots of people's in that when you grow up in care. I mean, grow mm. up. I was in care in, in my teens. It, back in those days, you're in residential, and as such, you lived with people from all over the world. You know, you live, yeah. <laughs> you know, you lived with people from many different cultures. It was a very embracing experience in that regard, which mm. is 
and people in in my book the brightness of stars which looks over the generations in the 60s talk about racism in children's homes talk about children's hair being tugged and them cry, children crying and you know when that growing up around that is very different a very different experience mm. i think and there's an intersection as well that i'm interested in around being of color and being in care because Mm. Uh, there's very little research about that actually yeah. uh, and, and, and we, data and collection know, absolutely and we know that st- statistically there are a, a very high number of children that are children of color that are in care and yeah. we know that very often they their foster parents and their adopted parents are white yes and that's just because we don't have enough people of color in the, that are willing to be foster carers and adoptees that are registered and that are within the system. So it's inevitable that that's going to be the circumstances that they're in. I think there are some accounts of carers that have shared their stories, but they need to, we need more research on that because that would be really useful to see what the impact is and what the dynamic is of being raised in that kind of environment. I think it's huge. Again, in the book, there's one story of uh, an adoption placement, white adopters and he was black or mixed race and he start he is starting to unpick some of that stuff again i i mm-hmm. met someone the other day i mean it, it is a more common experience but that brings with it a whole heap of different traumas of Absolutely. of loss beyond the usual adoption story loss mm. there's a loss of a history of culture of identity of it's it, it looks huge. I, yeah. I was in a space the other day with somebody and they were just starting to unpick that journey. And I just, I literally just felt like, whoa, <laughs> that's yeah. huge. And I think this is where there's a, there's a very different and a clear distinction between somebody who is raised in a society that privileges whiteness and a child that is raised to know that they are the set standard in, in, in some senses of what it means to be a human being. If you look at visibility in terms of the color of the skin, the texture of their hair, or if you look at it in terms of intelligence, you're raised in a society that has said, scientifically, you are superior educationally you are superior visibly you are superior and it is it's so embedded within the narrative that you live your life on an everyday basis without ever questioning that and that becomes so ingrained that it becomes part of your unconscious you live your life in that way on the other side of the scale you've got and again this is not a generalization but the way that historic trauma works is that you have people that have experienced colonialism, that have experienced slavery, that have experienced forced displacement, that have had their history erased, their languages lost, that have got history of violence to their peoples. And now you have these individuals who are encountering that historic trauma, which is cumulative, have now got a very high sensitivity and a vulnerability to stress. Mm. So something that may seem as though it's a small everyday interaction may be a trigger for that individual because of some of the things that have been so deeply embedded. And to give you a clear example of that is this notion of microaggressions. And the terminology of microaggressions for me is extremely problematic because we think about it as everyday encounters that are about devaluing and delegitimizing an individual. But when we think about it as everyday experiences, we reduce the weight of how heavy that burden is. And if you think about that, for example, of somebody that's receiving a racist remark or somebody who is, their experience of racism is being denied by being told, are you sure you've experienced that? That person isn't racist. That person is colorblind. They don't see race, for example. Those comments are not happening to that person for the first time. They're adding to the burden and the trauma that that person has experienced, possibly for their entire life. And again, this is, this is not to generalize everybody's experiences, but if somebody has that high sensitivity to stress, that thing might be a trigger for them. And again, as a society, we don't pay enough 
attention to that. So again, if you've got two people that are doing anti-racist work, one person being a person of color and another person that's being white, the individual who is white may be encountering discomfort, but for the person who is a person of color that is doing anti-racist work and is going into majority white spaces and trying to educate people on the way that a system works, they are walking into what could potentially be a re-traumatizing and violent space for them. So the weight of those responsibilities is very different and we don't pay enough attention to that. So how, what's the best way of managing that? I mean, it's, 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 it's very similar, I guess, in some ways to having the conversation about any kind of trauma, which is yeah. about keeping people safe and helping people yeah. manage that into personal safety. Uh, and I think that's a really important conversation that we're having uh, because there's only so much as someone who goes in having different conversations uh, around traumas, how do we ensure that people understand their own internal workings? Because it's all very well saying if you feel uncomfortable, but what you're saying to me is that, you know, you might be working with somebody who is in that permanent state of discomfort. So how do you know you feel too uncomfortable that you actually need to leave because it feels very traumatizing? Do you know what I mean? These that conversation yeah. alone yeah. is is you know a good hour, yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's very very difficult, and it's not. There's no simple answer to it, but doing anti-oppressive work is about constantly creating those spaces where dialogue is possible, where you have other people that are also doing anti-oppressive work that are reflecting and that are considering the questions that you're considering in a space that is relatively safe. And I say relatively safe because I don't think there's a space that is safe for a group all the time. So, and you don't know what people are coming in with to, with the space. So you, there is that relative safety that Mm -hmm. could be created. I do think it's about also acknowledging that we are constantly having to reflect on what our privileges are. And sometimes that might mean recognizing that even though you feel uncomfortable, you still have the privilege of being able to walk away Mm. from something. And that in itself is a privilege. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it because self-care is extremely important and you can't do the work of uh, uh, challenging oppressive systems if you are damaging your mental health health and well-being at the same time. So self-care is extremely important, but it's also about thinking about what are the boundaries of your discomfort and what are the boundaries of another person's discomfort and creating those networks so that you have the capacity and you have the allyship and you have other people that are doing this anti-oppressive work. So if it does reach the point where you have an encounter that is making you feel so uncomfortable that you can't push this any further, you have other people that you can call upon and say, I need support. I need help. This, I can't confront this on my own or I'm not in a position to confront this particular situation or I don't know what to do and being willing to say that I think we've got the misconception that society tells us we have to know what we're doing all the time and we we shouldn't be making mistakes but the work of challenging systems is and the work of unlearning is recognizing that we are going to make mistakes along the way and that we're going to be saying I don't know how can I be better along the way and if you're doing that you're doing something right Mm. and 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 you know if you if you if you need to saying sorry you know absolutely part of that repair work I'm really interested Mm. about resistance and being in doing a PhD so being in an academic institution and I've been wondering about enough of those to know that they're not particularly diverse spaces either yeah uh, what what was that experience like? Well, I was the only non-international student that was a person of color, um, wow. and it was and it was really interesting because I was I was on, and, and I've I've got a blog that talks about the nomad the educational nomad and and existing in this space in between, and it's been like that my entire educational experience. But it was more prominent in the PhD than any other time because I was a person of color but I wasn't an international student, so I wasn't part of that category. Even though the first day I started my PhD, I was given a leaflet for English language classes that was only placed on the desk of only the international students. 
I was a home student, but I was the only person of color that was a home student on that was doing the PhD at the time. I was also the only person of color that was on a scholarship. And so it was a really interesting and unusual position to be in because the scholarship affords you a lot of privilege when you're doing a PhD to be able to access opportunities like teaching opportunities, um, going to conferences, etc. And I was very aware that I was privileged because of the scholarship that I had. But I was also aware that on a day-to-day basis, I was made very aware of the fact that I, I didn't hold privilege physically as a black Muslim woman in a space that was almost entirely white and Eurocentric. And the only other people of color that were in the building were international students who were treated really poorly as well. What a fascinating embodied experience though, while Mm. writing about it for your PhD. Absolutely. You know, to just (laughs) have that in your face the whole time, it's just like, you know, real, you know, real lifetime material to sort of Mm. keep bouncing around what you're reading, what you're feeling, what you're living, what you're seeing. Really, really interesting. And, you know, you're talking about that whole kind of unconscious bias thing right there. Well, you must be an international student then. Absolutely. And my PhD topic was really apt for what I was experiencing because my focus is actually looking at the experiences of young Somali boys within the education system and how they navigate identity and belonging within that space. And as I was collecting my data and and writing the thesis, I was talking about how these young men were, were developing the resilience and the skills that they needed to navigate spaces that they felt were unsafe. And I was simultaneously doing the same thing doing my PhD, uh, writing a thesis that was structured in a way that everybody was seeing, uh, was saying was radical, but it wasn't radical. I was just centering narratives. Mm-hmm. Um, and so even the way that I was doing my PhD was seen as you're being othered in this space. So it wasn't even just the fact that I was othered in, physically in the space. It was my practice of how I was choosing to write and how I was choosing to construct my research othered me and was seen as radical because I was choosing to center black authors. I was choosing to center the narratives of the young men that I was working with. And I took an interdisciplinary approach that that made sure that I wasn't just centering narratives that were based on education because the majority of that literature was written by white men. Mm. And were you able in your PhD to put that whole embodied experience isn't it in your positionality and talking about the realities of being you while doing undertaking that research absolutely and I was really fortunate to have really supportive PhD supervisors and Mm. both of my PhD supervisors were white both of them acknowledged very early on that there were limits to their knowledge but there was a willingness to learn And what they offered me was invaluable because it was the support that I needed. It was the the freedom to be able to express myself how I wanted, but also respect for the rigor and the scholarly contribution I was still making and not questioning that just because I wanted to also account for the fact that this was an embodied experience and that needed to be captured in my reflections within the thesis as well. And they saw that as a strength and I saw it as a strength as well. So having that shared understanding of what the purpose of the thesis and what the purpose of the PhD was, was really important for me. So for me, my supervisors were a fundamental part of why I was able to successfully complete that PhD because there were times where I didn't want to. No, I mean, anyone who's done a PhD actually says that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, can I get off? Can I get off now? You know, get off the but, train. Um, can I get it's off usually, the train it's now? Usually at the two year mark as well, <laughs> when you start writing up. Yeah. I mean, I'm really fascinated by narratives mm. from a different mm. angle, but just the stories that we tell ourselves, the stories that inform our lives that inform decisions we make and relationships we allow ourselves to have and you know money that we're allowed to earn and places that we're able to go based on all of those um stories and so that's something I'm really interested in what Mm. did you find anything that 
was either something you hadn't anticipated or something, a narrative that you hadn't considered? What were your kind of findings that came up where you thought, wow, that's, Mm. that's something? Well, there, there were a couple of reasons why I wanted to use narrative to begin with. The first was purely because I was working with young Somali men and the Somali community is an oral community. So storytelling mm-hmm. and poetry is an integral part of how we have always expressed our experiences and have shared what those experiences are. So I knew that it was something that would connect with the young men and it was something that would feel I would be at ease with doing and it was really centering what the community experience was. So for me, that was important. The second reason why I did it was because at the same time as doing my PhD, I was also doing some my training to, for counselling. So I was doing counselling skills at the time. And within that, we were exposed to lots of different models of counselling. And narrative therapy for me was just, and art therapy as well, were really just captured the expression and the indigenous expression that I was used to. And the idea of people being able to separate what they are able to name from what they're able to express through a story and being able to capture really vulnerable emotions in a way that somebody doesn't have to potentially put themselves in a vulnerable position. Mm. So what I asked the participants of the research to do was, it was an emergent piece of research and we did, we created it together. And one of the things that they said to me was, we want to be able to express our experiences how we want to. So what I asked them to do was to create artifacts and I named it as artifacts because I didn't want to limit it to storytelling. So I asked them to produce artifacts of what their experience of school is and left it at that really broad. They went away and they brought a number of different things to me. So some of them did sketches, some of them did lyrics, some of them brought in books and videotapes that had been used within their classroom space. Some of them wrote stories. It was a real range of artifacts that they brought. And what was really interesting was The following part of that was initially meant to be interviews, but each of these young men told me that they didn't want to do interviews because they had had negative interviewed experiences with adults. And so they said, can we just have a conversation because we want to talk to you, but we also want you to share what your thoughts are on what we've produced. So they wanted it to be a two-way dialogue. And that's interesting just in itself, isn't it? Because there's this long-held tradition in research around Mm. how you collect story, how you collect narratives. And actually that even by being present in those conversations, that somehow that means that you're tampering with the data. Exactly. You know, so for them to say that to you and for you to be able to incorporate that, I think that's really powerful. Absolutely. And it demonstrated for me a really sophisticated understanding on their part Mm. of how data is interpreted. Because even if they hadn't said, let this be a conversation and uh, let this be just an interview, you ask us questions. As researchers, very often we don't acknowledge the fact that when we are analyzing data, we are always analyzing it within our own frame of reference, within the knowledge that we hold. And so there is interpretation that is taking place. And I was really reluctant to interpret their stories because I knew I would be coming at it from my own lived experiences. Some of those connected with theirs and some of those was very, were very distant. What was really powerful for me in the, in the conversations that we had after the artifacts were collected was that the young men, only one of them actually made mentions explicitly of what was in their artifact. The rest of them used it as prompts to bounce other stories out of so other stories emerged from the artifacts that they had created and I found that to be really powerful because if I had analyzed that those artifacts on their own it may have taken me in a very different direction that's really interesting Mm. and and really gives space to hearing voice to hearing voice um that like you say hasn't been you know messed about with through our own lens and perception Mm. opens up that space really nicely and we Um, take we take for granted how much young people know so one of the young men produced a sketch and within the sketch he had two images of himself 
but, but very different images in terms of the clothing and the appearance. And when I asked him what the sketch was, he said, one is how I'm perceived and the other is how I, how I choose to perform. And wow. he, he gave a really, he gave a really complicated, nuanced narrative of how he feels when he walks into a classroom, the teacher perceives him to be one thing. And therefore he comes into the classroom and makes the decision to either negotiate the space performing how he thinks the teacher expects him to perform or actively choosing to resist. And so there, there is almost a conversation or a dialogue that is taking place there between the young people and the teacher that is unspoken. And I just found that to be really powerful. That's really powerful because actually, how many children are walking into a classroom? And making, making choices. Yeah, making those kind of, like you say, very nuanced decisions about who they're going to show up as that day. Mm. But what he was able to do was articulate that yeah in a really powerful way absolutely that's that's yeah. pretty awesome yeah and we almost have to do that work with teachers i think we have to create spaces where teachers can actually reflect and have a think about what they're bringing into the classroom yeah. and what they're choosing to bring into the classroom and what they may not be aware they're bringing into the classroom as well because there are internal decisions that are being made by every teacher that walks into the classroom. We just don't talk about those decisions because we assume that the educator is the bearer of knowledge and therefore their job is to go into the classroom and deliver the subject. And the human experience is just removed. And actually we're straight back to needing to have self-awareness, to be very reflective, to be okay with, to be working in an environment where it's safe to be vulnerable. Yeah. And we cannot take for granted that the system, any system that we go Mm. into, affords that space for the people working in it. Uh, I go into Mm. lots of spaces that do, uh, and I equally go into lots of spaces that don't. And I guess that's always the challenge in having these conversations. That's always the difficulty thinking about it. And I would argue that education is one of the few space, one of the few professions that almost trains us from a very, very, from the very, very start to remove ourselves from our profession. Like we remove the human experience. In teacher education programs, the only time reflection is mentioned is when trainees are told about reflective practice. Evaluate what you've done, think about what works well, what doesn't work well. We're not told to reflect on how we feel. We're not told to reflect on how we're managing our emotions, how a space may create or trigger particular types of emotions. We're not told about who's going to be in our classroom, the complex needs that we're going to encounter on a day-to-day basis and how we manage those whilst also simultaneously taking care of ourselves. There is so much missing from the teacher education program that once those teachers go into schools, they don't have the time to reflect. They don't have the time to think about themselves. And then you've got, especially as people of color that are, are, that are educators now, carrying that burden and that trauma and the, that vulnerability into spaces that traumatize them as children. And now they are working in those spaces and the adults that are working around them, the colleagues that they now have, are not aware that they are continuing the practices that they experience with young people. Yeah, I think that's that's really powerful. And I would like to think there has been some shift of late in creating more reflective thinking Mm. supervision is coming up a lot for head teachers Uh, both of those are new to the profession that maybe afford that opportunity for teachers of color to have those questions but the challenge is of course if they're having that supervision Mm. and it's not with somebody who's been on that journey exactly then that conversation has a dead end doesn't it yeah And I think the reality is because of the demographic that we're working with, it's very unlikely that you're going to get a supervisor or somebody that's going to be mentoring you or or that is going to be another person of color. I think the reality of that is not one that we're in at the moment. And so what I think is important is not necessarily just focusing primarily on representation and getting people 
to work within schools and do the mentoring and do the supervising. But how do we educate the white teachers that we have? How do we educate the white school leads that we have? How do we educate those that are supervising the head teachers to ensure that they are coming at this from an anti-oppressive lens? So that regardless of whether or not they've experienced what that individual has experienced, they're able to guide and support them with compassion, with reflexivity, and with a recognition that that person is experiencing something that you may not have experienced. And so you have to give them the support that is in line with what they need rather than what you think they need. Yeah. And I would add into that, get comfortable with white privilege and what that means. Um, Yeah. And get comfortable with being uncomfortable. (laughs) Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Absolutely. Uh, Muna, what a great conversation. It's been so interesting to me on, on so many yeah. levels, certainly. It's been a pleasure. Oh, good. I'm really it's glad. It's been a pleasure. Um, I'm totally comfortable with being uncomfortable. And, and, you know, that's the world I work in. It was mm. the environment I uh, emerged in, <laughs> you know, yeah. being uncomfortable. Comfortable with being uncomfortable is a very probably far too comfortable a place for me actually Uh, (laughs) but um really I'm just so glad that we got the chance because I felt really bad that I hadn't you know come to your workshop and I really wanted to (laughs) (laughs) yours was brilliant I I took so much notes on the day it was brilliant oh Muna stop Um, (laughs) but yeah so I'm just really glad we got to have this conversation and I hope I really hope that people listening you know want to deepen the conversation or what we've talked about adds to what people are thinking about and in the contents below I'll make sure that I have some links to you and to your work uh, and your Twitter your Twitter account obviously so people can ask which is very active (laughs) yes I'm afraid I'm I'm an active Twitterer Uh, I heard a phrase that fits very comfortably with me ranting with references um, yes <laughs> I love that that's brilliant it's great isn't it I wish yeah. it was mine it wasn't there's no such <laughs> there's, there's very very little original thought really but I can't even remember I can't even give it credit to who said it but I um I really like that and, and that appeals to me a lot so Muna thank you so much for coming on my pleasure um, thank you for inviting me my pleasure have yourself a great day you too take care You've been listening to the Trauma, Resonance, Resilience podcast with me, your host, Lisa Cherry, brought to you straight from the heart of the knowledge that high quality relationships are the cornerstone of learning, healing and growing. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing or reviewing. Until next time.